Okay, I know I titled this video Alcoholism Documentary, but in hindsight, I really wish I would have called it Recovery Documentary because on this channel, we are really focused on bringing you the solutions to addiction and alcoholism. There are plenty of other people and organizations out there talking about the problem, and they're doing a great job of advocacy and reducing the stigma around addiction. But it's our goal to give you the tools, supports, and resources that you need to beat addiction and alcoholism, whether that's for yourself or for someone that you care about. And we bring you those solutions through a combination of science and story. And today you're going to hear a remarkable story from Nate. He's going to talk to you about his journey of recovery out of alcoholism and stimulant abuse. Now, as you listen to Nate tell his story, I want you to pay particular attention to three factors that were really important for Nate's solution. So listen out for the factors that led Nate to become willing to accept help. And then pay attention to the timing and the way that that help was offered to him. And lastly, pay particular attention to Nate's process from treatment into the recovery community. And one last thing before we get to Nate's video, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to this channel because every single week we're going to bring you even more solutions to the problem of addiction and alcoholism. And as an extra special bonus for anyone that watches Nate's video and subscribes to this channel, we're going to donate a dollar to the recovery organization of Nate's Choice. All you need to do is subscribe subscribe and go into the comments below and just write these words, write, donate my subscription. Okay, I know you came here to hear from Nate, so here he is. I would drink beer from the time I got up in the morning and gradually throughout the day until I would kind of pass out and go to sleep. And that was became more and more like a completely daily routine. So there's nothing really glorious about my, my kind of demise uh, of my uh, substance use life. It was, uh, it was running out, you know. Would you say at the time, like between 25 and 27, would you have called yourself a functional alcoholic? I know that's not like a clinical term, but like... No, I, I think. Were you functioning? I th thank goodness I wouldn't, because I know there are a lot of folks who can do quite well, like operating in the world, um, and have disruptive relationships with substances like alcohol and other things, um, and that can be confusing. It would have been for me. So, for example, if I had been able to keep a job for a long period of time, like pay my own bills, take care of myself. Mm -hmm. Um, not have uh, like family or other relationship challenges just keep reoccurring and popping up and kind of devastating my sort of status quo, then I might have had a harder time maybe relinquishing that relationship, not okay. with substances. But I wasn't. I was. Fair amount of unmanageability. Yeah, the way I mean, you'd say it, okay. yeah. So as I was watching the world kind of move, and my fellows, like my peers, kind of gradually move into an adulthood, I was very stuck, and um, and really for me that was not that was an existential dilemma. And I've talked to many folks uh, in recovery who can definitely relate to this. It wasn't about taking my life. That wasn't really ever anything I would have like, like taken that much action to do something about. Mm -hmm. But almost even worse, there was a lack of a desire to be, mm -hmm. like to be alive, mm -hmm. like you know, and, and uh, it's hopelessness. Um, and I can identify that version of me and characterize that person with those those thoughts, that despair, hopelessness, and really no no sort of daily way to fix that, you know? What would the people around you, like I know people that know you now, and if I had to say, like if I had to say, what, what would people tell me about Nate, they would say, oh, he's all out there, you know, like he's in the middle of everything, he's uh, personable and talkative, and he like, you know. Yeah. They give a lot of energy, I guess is what I would say. Yeah, that, 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 that person say. had succumbed, you know, and that was one of the problems. Probably 22, 23, I, I, I can look back now and say I was definitely in my 
addiction, uh, like it had a hold of my life, but um, I was still like able to act that that part, like that part of me that I call it kind of the light. That light was still in there and still shining. But those years in between, you know, 24, 25, 26, the light began to dim. Gotcha. And so, although some people might, I, I wasn't available to people, right? I wasn't, I didn't have friends that I was gregarious around. I, I, my, I was like removed, I was, gre- I was dimming, I was going out. Which is know. kind of interesting. Because what I know about you, you're sort of an all-in kind of guy. Yeah. And I can imagine in your 20s, Yeah. you must have been that way prior to... It definitely didn't feel right. Okay. You know, um, and that was one of the reasons why I think it was a perfect time, how I started out that, uh, describing that. It was a perfect time for me to be introduced to some alternatives, to be given um, some hopefulness, to replace the hopelessness. Mm-hmm. Um, I was very ready for that. A little different than like a bottom, like we talk about. Mm -hmm. But I think for me, that existential tension, I've been able to see that in others. Mm -hmm. And and that's a way of understanding it. That's a little bit maybe safer in some ways than like, than like a material bottom. Right. Like it wasn't one certain thing. It was just sort of an exhaustion, hopelessness. I'm tired of yeah and then the solution for that i was i was open to it because so much of that light had been dimmed i was you know i was i was ready for some change i'm not a person who wants to be in despair right. you know I, i'm not it's inherently not hopeless right. exactly and that's something that i think substances can are so tricky you know the um some of the recovery communities use some terminology and, and you know that cunning, baffling, powerful piece, like relationships with substances and behaviors that can become so dysfunctional in our lives are baffling to us. Mm-hmm. They you know, they, they really take us away from the versions of ourselves that we might aspire to be. And so that I, I can put it in those eloquent terms now. But then it was just you could see it right you come into my room and you'd be like despair hopelessness alcoholism this dude's not okay. <laughs> no okay. you know my family and this is one of the real powerful things about these types of illnesses and I, I really believe that they they transcend an individual right? like I've heard it said you know alcoholism or addiction these type some mental illnesses these illnesses are so powerful that they effect and sometimes even kill people that don't even have them Mm -hmm. family members intergenerational so that was that was something my parents experienced my dad is a minister and a family therapist and yet he was perfectly incapable of being able to um sort of see right in front of him the the kind of demise of of this this person that was his son Dad was a minister yeah. therapist. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I have a video one day about what that's like growing up. Yeah, there's some interesting... <laughs> that's, that's story. But like any parent who feels sideswiped by a relationship to some, but to a child or um, that feels maybe that they should have known or that they were equipped to know what... It's, the evidence suggests otherwise. Mm-hmm. Um, it very much affected my parents ability to mm-hmm. contemplate it mm-hmm. so in you know in co- cognitive behavioral therapy we think about cognitive distortions i mean my family was having delusions mm-hmm. you know around what my state of health was mm-hmm. what actually got you into treatment was it yeah. did your family sort of confront you did you just take yourself what happened well just like we were just discussing i think my family finally on a in a very pragmatic way stopped pretending that they were equipped to deal with this situation. 27 year old oldest son living at home after being away, you know, for years, kind of returning after one failure after another. And obviously having this relationship with substances, it wasn't even hidden really. Um, And just that willingness, that initial, willingness to be humble 
trying to do something that they weren't equipped to do. They were too close mm -hmm. to the illness, mm -hmm. such that it affected them, like I was describing. So in that, they're giving up on something they couldn't have done anyway, allowed for me to also kind of do the same. And so with the help of a, a therapist uh, who had, was very patient and waiting for me to come around to saying, you know, I get drunk before I come see you out in the parking lot. Every time I drink three or four cans of Milwaukee's Best, you know, I keep a cooler in my back seat and it's filled with not ice, but cans of warm, cheap, you know, beer. And I drink before I come see you. And, you know, in a nutshell, I'm tired of that and, and I don't know what to do. And she had never pushed me or said, I smell alcohol in your breath or you have an alcohol. Like I was there seeing her for probably about 18 months because I had this, this like, uh, kind of a failure to grow up. There's like a term for like, like I couldn't uh, like adapt to being right. a grown up. Failure to launch. Yeah. I mean, ba right, yeah. right. But with alcohol, I mean, thank goodness there's a pretty good reason, right? Mm -hmm. There are a number of reasons, but the, the substance right. use, the relationship with substances was definitely an impediment to me bridging um, that. So she right. was willing to make some recommendation. In your mind, were you seeing that therapist for depression and anxiety? Were you seeing that therapist for? Yeah, that, that, what did you think that's a really time? good question. Um, I had always had um, experiences seeing therapists, I think because my dad was one. Okay. I've had a, a, a challenge being comfortable in my own skin my whole life. Okay. So you'll hear that a lot from folks kind of entering a recovery and when, you know, they talk, tell their stories, they talk about when they had their first drink or had an experience with a substance that was very effective at alleviating some thing. of that. Yeah, that sense of just okayness. Mm -hmm. Sort of, for me, alcohol was, was real good at, at providing that. But the point that I didn't have it kind of naturally since I was a, a like a young child, like my first memories, was, it's helpful for me now to kind of understand why I might have developed that dysfunctional relationship mm -hmm. with substance, why, why that would have been such a an easy thing for me to slip into. Mm -hmm. So, but but I did have access to help, and so the idea of getting it was provided opportunity. However, I also was a PK and therapist kid, so like I thought I could outsmart and probably did outsmart a few of the people that I went to see, you know, but this, this one, this woman was fantastic because she just waited a long time for me to kind of get to that point. And then when I did finally give up, essentially stop fighting, stop coming up in a way, I mean, it wasn't that graceful. <laughs> um, she was like, well, here are some, here are some options and some ideas you could think about. Right. And, uh, I think about it now and I look back and I, it was like in one session, it was probably more like two or three, but in one session, I noticed that the books on her shelf had to do with addiction. Okay. So it's like everyone but me knew I was That's going to was see a counselor say. about was, my alcoholism. My next question was, do you think she didn't realize it until that moment you said her? Do you no. think she was just she waiting knew. for you? But she was very good at, at waiting. That terrible thing that happened that you then got forced into. Yeah, like the, a lot of the, the coercion was more organic. Like, like, mm -hmm. the, it, but it, the environment push. I believe our environments push us towards health if we're listening mm -hmm. and wellness. But so there is this sort of. It's not a bad coercion. It's sort of this like a wellness. Mm -hmm. Like my life, my light was pushing me towards healing. You know, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, there were events though. There were plenty of them. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that I, you know, in some ways this is an advantage, in some ways this might have kept me from uh, earlier realization, but, you know, being, you know, a, a middle class, you know, white male with a dad who's a minister and a counselor and kind of played that role in the communities we came up in, I mean, I, I couldn't get in trouble if I tried, you know, like, I, there were times I had been pulled over for drinking, running red lights, and police officer a couple times would let me go. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and I know I've heard others share that story, but that that's there were some things that probably wouldn't have happened like that for some other folks. You know, um, and come that way, it really came through this through this um, 
fairly quick decline in my motivation to like be alive and then the help was there Mm -hmm. right so my uh, therapist did put it in a certain way that was kind of cool she gave me three choices one was you could go up to Pennsylvania and stay in an inpatient treatment center for like six months Mm -hmm. and she sort of sat let me think about that for a minute then she's like or you could like come to some groups that I offer some outpatient stuff and maybe do that two or three times a week and I thought about that but I had already been kind of doing that so the way that I was approaching this help my response to that was well I'll just tell everyone what they want to hear and keep drinking in the parking lot for me at that time that's that I needed it I needed something more you had enough insight to know that you needed to have I did but but when she's like Pennsylvania six months I'm like no 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 no. that that seems kind of extreme six Uh you know so she but she knew me right Mm -hmm. and then she's like or there's a treatment center right here you know not too far from here uh and it's you know 28 days sometimes Mm -hmm. six weeks depending on your needs um and you could you know, go in and take a look at some of this stuff. So I was like, yeah, I'll go with the middle option. You She's know, a good like, negotiator. Yeah. That's what I say, start high. Yeah. Because then whatever you say next sounds like really good. Yeah. Okay. And immediately I was relieved, you know, to kind of have, you know, just something different, you know. Um, but from that point, she and the group of my network of help, you know, that was around me went into action, you know, that that illness, that misunderstanding of what was going on, because of this space for healing to come in and the help of a professional and others, what we would call today a recovery coach. Mm -hmm. But it was a client of hers who had gone through a, a process and he was a member of a recovery community there and immediately um, knew that she could, or she had spoken to him and and said, well, here's this guy's number. In the meantime, while we're working on trying to get you in, maybe you could hang out with him. Did you call him? I did. Wow. I did, yeah. I mean, like, again, like all, I had, I had made every mistake. Like, so it's not like this awesome thing that I, I'm 27 and I go in and like I get a chip and I it's the same white chip I have now. Yeah, but I waited till I was 27. Like there are a lot of opportunities to access a change in my life before that. Mm -hmm. The only reason I have one chip is because I'm stubborn, Mm -hmm. you know, and I waited, Mm -hmm. and then I'm stubborn once I got into recovery, you know, Mm -hmm. for better or worse, you know, I wasn't gonna give up. So it took you a long time to come to it, but when you came to it, you sort of, you came to it. I was, like yeah, like, I was yeah. finished. Like, mm-hmm. I was very finished. Like, I tapped it out. There was no more. Was it that sort of, like, sick and tired of being sick and tired yeah. kind of thing? I, I mean, absolutely. I was sick of, of life. life. It wasn't me, you know. Mm-hmm. It wasn't me. So I was immediately pretty excited when I saw that there was some, another choice. And, and, it, and it was working, you know. Um, so, But I did call him. But we were talking about those moments, those God shot type moments, the, the uh, synchronicities. I call him. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's like going to be two weeks maybe before I can go into the, the treatment center place. And we arrange for him to come and take me to a meeting. Mm-hmm. His name was Mike. His Mike. And, uh, but before that, so he's going to come, we're going to go the next day. This all probably happened over about a week period of time and we're going to go. So that I had shown some willingness to myself, to the people who were invested in helping me. Um, and I, and I was like, that was really helpful just to set a course one little step at a time. You know, I, I still was drinking, you know, Mm -hmm. but, um, but I was in, I was interested in something different, so I, I, I got to sort of partake of a different approach just gradually. Mm-hmm. But um, but before I could go to a meeting with them, I got a call and, and a, a bed had opened up because that, that's kind of how things go. But it was like, but you got to come like now, right? So I remember that being like, wait a minute, really? Like one of Not things? in two weeks. Am I really really sure? Am I yeah. Really ready? Kind of so that was good to kind of have that moment of. Am I gonna do this? Like this is for real. Or am I not? Yeah. And so I did. And my dad took me. And um and it was I was very fortunate. Very fortunate because the way that that program worked was, you know, they they made sure I was medically safe. Even 
even drinking, again, I didn't drink a lot of hard alcohol unless I could get my hands on it, but mm -hmm. people wouldn't let me near it because it was bad. Okay. But I had, been, I had alcohol in my system all the time, so I did need to have some withdrawal management. But like as soon as you got a, a chance to really look at kind of what was going on in your life situation, taking a break from yourself really, and, and taking a break from your relationship with the substances, mm -hmm. and having all that happen in one place with others going through the same exact experience was like a perfect social model type experience for me to go through. And then part of that treatment process, as soon as we were medically stable, we would get to go to community uh, recovery meetings, like out in the community, so in vans. Quickly, like, they sort of integrated you into, I call it like real life recovery. Yeah, you know, like, yeah. Like the real people out the there. The culture of life, recovery. Right, yeah, instead yeah. of just the sort of in treatment yeah sort of really contained model of recovery yeah okay and for me that was that was perfect because i was so hungry for something different but it had to be something substantial mm -hmm. you know um what do you remember thinking when you went to your first meeting like what's the real behind the scenes what did you think well i mean to be honest with you mm -hmm. there was enough social pieces like I had a couple buddies that I'd made in rehab. We'll just mm -hmm. use that language. Because at that time, that's what it was, mm -hmm. you know, to me. So I had a couple buddies who were, you know, like we were both a couple days in. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're joking and, and messing around. And um, there were young people there and middle people. And, you know, it was dynamic enough that it, like I could be social. Mm -hmm. Like it was like normal kind of. Okay. So, so... What it gave me was it gave me that it, some attention, some approval, some ability to access a social environment. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was very hungry for that because my drinking experience had really taken that away. At first, my drinking was, you know, Maybe included the, that. More connected. Right? Yeah, it for sure. Feel but I had been doing it long enough and enough years that that had been really kind of, uh, it stopped do, doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, environment of a recovery meeting or a, a community is so like your autonomy is very respected. I mean, they may give you advice and have suggestions, but they say it like in their readings, like it's suggestions, like mm -hmm. you will make the choice. Mm -hmm. Like I had all my little critiques, all my little manipulations around, you know, pushing back against authority. It wouldn't work in, in there because it's your choice it's to come if you want. With you. If you want to go out and drink or whatever, that we're not going to stop you, and then we wouldn't stop you from coming right back in here. We're in here for you guys, just like we were here for us. You know, there's nothing to fight against. Yeah, that sort of thing. Okay. I mean, you can always create something, but for me, that wasn't what I was going to fight against. So I was, I was in, you know. And other piece that was very critical was. I was able to stay in a recovery residence that was associated with the treatment center for the amount of time it took me to go through the outpatient program, mm -hmm. the post-treatment. Mm -hmm. And so that was about a month and a half, maybe two months. And so we went to lots mm -hmm. of meetings, I got back to work, I visited my family, I got my car back gradually. So you started to build a life mm -hmm. at the same time you were building recovery. Exactly. And so then the thing, the two things just more naturally work together because you built them that way. Well, and I think that it worked that way for a lot of folks, but I think the benefit we have today is we, we know the kind of evidence-based process of that and we can help establish that kind of scaffolding for folks intentionally. Mm -hmm. And I was very fortunate that the treatment center I went to kind of just had this mm -hmm. already organically in the environment and that can't always be the case. You kind of came to this point of, you know, sort of self-confession, I'm really done with this, I'm tired, a willingness to say, okay, I'll do that. You sort of, wasn't all perfect rainbow and sunshine, but for the most part, you sort of let go of the rope, I call it, and yeah. went through this process. So, do you, what are your thoughts about uh, people being like forced into treatment and leveraged into treatment? Yeah. What are your thoughts around all that? Well, I was, again, I'm, I'm very grateful for the fact I didn't have any fight left in me, you know, 
And I didn't want to fight. Like I saw that helping hand and I took it mm -hmm. in all the different shapes and, and sizes that came in. And the people who were offering the, those helping hands were very patient with the early recovery me.